Good, good. Y'all ready to laugh? Yeah. We're not in class anymore. You can, we're going to be loud, we're going to be laughing, we're going to be engaged. We got my boy Ernie G in the building. Let's give it up for Ernie G. He's so Ernie G, he's a guest entertainer. He's one of the top Latino comedians in the country. Uh, he's been seen by millions on TV shows such as Comedy Central's Make Me Laugh, BET's Comic View, and is one of the original stars of the hit show Que Locos, hosted by that one and only George Lopez. Y'all know George Lopez? Yeah. yeah. So he's a graduate of Loyola Marymount University with his degree in psychology and a minor in Chicano studies. Ernie was honored with the first ever Mario Moreno Cantinflas Award for his work in the Latino community. He was the keynote speaker at UCLA's 32nd Annual Raza graduation and spreads his message of transformation through laughter as the empowerment committee for the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. And today, we are all lucky to have him here at Highline College to inspire us and keep us going with our goals today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my boy, my good friend. Give it up one more time. Highline, welcome for Ernie G! All right, what's up, Highline College? How you guys doing? You guys good? Yeah, yeah you excited to be here? Yeah. All right, cool. Give it up for Joe, man. Joe releasing his inner DJ. <laughs> J J Joe's like academic advisor. He's like, you guys ready to party? Like, what's up, dog? He to, you can tell he used to be a DJ. All right, cool. So my name is Ernie G. I'm a Latino comedian from Los Angeles. I'm on a bunch of TV shows nobody watches. Um, <laughs> I'm so famous, I have to tell you how famous I am. Uh, <laughs> I was on a show a few years ago. What's up, buddy? How you doing, man? I love you. Look at that smile, bro. It's so beautiful. Uh, <clears throat> I was on a show a few years ago. Clap if you think you remember, or maybe your parents used to watch, a Latino comedy show called Que Locos. Does anybody remember Que Locos out there? All right, two Latinos. <laughs> <laughs> Two Latinos have cable. All right, cool, awesome. Because <laughs> you know Latinos don't like paying for cable. <laughs> one dude in the neighborhood gets cable, and then the whole neighborhood taps into that one box right there, right? And then we have the audacity to complain when our cable goes out. <laughs> hey, my cable went out. You owe me 50 bucks, dog. You owe me 50 bucks. Que Locos was this English language comedy show that came out on Spanish language television. So you'd be watching what you think is Comedy Central, and then they'd cut to commercial and it'd be all Bienvenido a Galavision. You're like, what the heck? Um, it was hosted by the number one Latino comedian in the country. We're my George Lopez fans. Got some George Lopez fans out there, yeah? All right, cool. I always like saying thank you to George for opening doors for us. I started my career with Gabriel Iglesias. You guys know Fluffy? I'm not fat on Fluffy. You guys know Fluffy? So me, George, Gabriel, we were all on that show called Que Locos. We traveled the country uh, performing in places all over the country. And, but now I do something called empowerment comedy, which is comedy with an inspirational message. Uh, and we're going to get into that in a moment. But I just want to acknowledge really quick that you're going to hear me say the word Latino pretty often in the next hour or so. You're gonna hear me say the word Hispanic pretty often because I'm Latino or Hispanic, depending on wh what flavor of the month we're talking about here, right? <laughs> but when you hear the word Latino and you hear the word Hispanic over and over again and you don't happen to be Latino or Hispanic, there's like this kind of underlying assumption that maybe I'm not really speaking to you. I want you to know if you can hear my voice, I'm speaking to each and every one of you, okay? Just like you don't gotta be black to love Dave Chappelle, right? You don't have to be black to love you some Kevin Hart. All right, all right, all right, right? You don't have to be Korean to love Margaret Cho, right? You don't have to be Latino to love Ernie G. You need two things to love you some Ernie G. A, you gotta love to laugh. If you love to laugh, you gotta love you some Ernie G. And B, you gotta wanna be inspired. So if you love to laugh and you wanna be inspired, can I hear you make some noise? Is that everyone? That should be everyone, right? That should be everyone. I love being Latino. I'm proud to be Latino. But people always ask me, what's the G for? Ernie G. Is it Garcia, Gutierrez, Gonzalez? My full name is Ernesto Tomas Grichevsky. <laughs> Messed you up with that one. <laughs> I thought you were Latino, stupid. <laughs> I'm a Mexican American, Puerto Rican, Russian, and French Catholic Jew. I am this country, gosh darn it. <laughs> My mom's from Mexico, born and raised in El DF. She's Chilanga hasta las cachas, way. <laughs> if you don't know what that means, too bad. Uh, <laughs> no, I just mean she's Mexican through and through, all the way down to her pistol holders. <laughs> My dad's Puerto Rican, so I'm mostly Mexican. Hey, hey, hey. Have you ever noticed Puerto Ricans are arrogant salsa dancers? You ever notice that? If you've ever been salsa dancing, you'll notice that Puerto Ricans, Cubans, and Dominicans dance salsa like, I know I look good, I know I look good. You wish you looked like me, <laughs> but you don't. I know I look good. 
Mexicans, we love dancing salsa, but we end up mixing salsa with this other Latin dance called cumbia. We look like we're dancing the chicken dance. You clapped in your head right now, huh, bro? Look at him. He's like, I love the chicken dance, bro. And here's the thing, y'all. I'm so proud to be here. For, you know, my buddy Joe, I met Joe at Washington State University in 2008 when he was an undergraduate student, and now he's an academic uh, advisor bro, right here, and he's the one who brought me here. And I'm really proud of the fact that I have thousands of students all over the country that I inspired back in the day, and now they're all professionals doing their thing. I just flew in from uh, El Paso, Texas yesterday. I performed, at, I was at Stanford last Saturday uh, performing, and now I'm here at Highline College in Des Moines, Washington, baby. <laughs> doing my thing and it's beautiful because we have a diverse crowd here and I love that because you know the whole point of it is that we're all the same underneath it all right so we're gonna laugh you're gonna hear me say Latino a lot and some of the jokes you're gonna really laugh at some of them you're not gonna get as much and you'll see the Hispanic kids going <laughs> <laughs> and like those of you who aren't Latino are gonna be laughing at the Latinos laughing so hard at me <laughs> which is gonna be really fun and then but it's gonna be like a reverse kind of dynamic because sometimes Latinos are in classes and all the Caucasian kids are cracking up and the Latinos are like, I don't get it, I don't really get it. <laughs> so the dynamic is gonna reverse here today, which is a beautiful thing, I, just, I think what we want, right? And uh, is it me or does anybody else feel bad for white people now? <laughs> I feel bad for white people now, huh? Because they voted him in, they voted him in, right? So I feel bad for them now, because you know he's not really doing what they thought he was gonna do, right? It's so weird because that term white people has become so divisive, huh? You can't even say the term white people anymore. It has like an edge now, white people, white people, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it, it's like white people has become like the new N-word, you know what I'm saying? It's true, have you noticed that? Like you say, dude, are there gonna be white people there? Shut up, dude, they're right there, they can hear you, dude. Don't be saying white people, they're right there, dude. They can hear you, bro. You know, it's true. And poor Manicitos, I feel bad. If you're a white person that's at my show, welcome. Thank you for being here, okay? I, I know we're probably on a similar page, right? But even, white people don't even like being called white no more. You know what I mean? Is your family white? No, my mom's from Ireland, my dad's from England, but we are not white, okay? We are not white. No, we are not white. It's just all these negative stereotypes associated to that, you know what I mean? I feel so bad, you know? It's just the whole point, the good thing is that we're all starting to learn that you can't put people in boxes. That's the whole point, right? You can't just assume that somebody's that way because of their skin, because of the way they, you know, like uh, one of my favorite artists, India Ari, I am not my hair, I am not my skin, I am the soul that lives within, you know what I'm saying? India Ari, she's, she's a beast. And the other thing too is I think God is trying to teach us a, a lesson. I think God is trying to give us a gift. And the gift that God is trying to give us, the lesson that he's trying to teach us is that when the races mix, when different cultures mix, the children always come out gorgeous. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? Like a black daddy and an Asian mommy. You ever seen that combo, black and Asian? That kid's gorgeous, huh? Or, or Asian and Caucasian. You ever seen that combination? That kid's gorgeous, right? Or anybody and Latino, that kid is gorgeous. That's all I'm trying to say. That's all I'm trying to say, right? We got that Latin blood, baby. That Latin blood. Hey, hey. My girl right here, I asked her when she came in, I said, where are you mixed? She's I'm black, white, and Filipino. Hey. She's like, we're all going to look like you in about like 200 years we're all gonna look like that beautiful mix of all these different races it's beautiful what's up bro paisa hasta las cachas wey huh bro huh i love it that's an inside joke it just means i can tell this dude is very mexicano right here right are you mexicano a little mix because you could also be peruvian too i just came back from peru machu picchu where's your family from oh you want to go is that on your bucket list too i know uh, I just got back from my hiking the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu, which is one of those seven, uh, it's not one of the seven wonders of the world, it's one of the modern marvels of the world, I think, something like that. But your family's from Mexico? De que parte? Oh, so you're Mexican Chapin. I love it, bro, I love it, cool. He's like, how do you know that? <laughs> and look at they're all, what does that mean? <laughs> Latinos, it's weird, like we, we also have nicknames for each other, Bori Puerto Ricans are Boricuas, Guatemalans are Chapines. So it's just, you know, I don't like talking about race too much, but it's just there always, you know? Who's more racist against other Mexicans? Other Mexicans, huh? <laughs> and you know, that black people are racist against each other a lot of the times, right? My mom was so racist as a kid uh, when I was growing up, like she didn't even realize it. Like she'd go, mijo, let's go to the beach. I'm like, oh cool, we're going to Santa Monica? She goes, I don't like Santa Monica. I go, why not? She goes, too many Mexicans there, too many Mexicans. <laughs> 
but we're Mexican. And she goes, we're not those kind of Mexicans, man. <laughs> Dang, mom, you know what I mean? I just think we need to hang out with each other. You know what I'm saying? I think it's a beautiful thing that we got to just hang out and get to learn from each other and know each other. I love being Latino. I'm proud to be Latino. But like I said, with a name like Ernesto Tomas Grichevsky, <laughs> I was never really accepted anywhere. Like, you know, it's weird. When you don't get accepted anywhere, you kind of learn to be accepted everywhere, right? You learn to kind of compensate and to kind of do what you got to do to fit in everywhere. It's a beautiful thing. You know, people that grow up in like, you know, mono, mono cultural society, you know, they don't learn how to expand and to uh, be appreciative of other people. And I learned to fit in everywhere because the Mexicans, the Cholos in my neighborhood, I grew up around Cholos. You guys know what Cholos are? You guys know what a Cholo is? For those of you who don't know, it's what most people refer to as like a Mexican or Salvadoran gang member. Right? It's what Mexicans and Salvadorans refer to as family members, right? And, uh, <laughs> That's not funny, there's one right there. Shut up, there's one right there. I just, I just, I just, I just, he is so not a cholo. You're like the opposite of a cholo, bro. You're like a fresa right there, more than anything. You look good, bro, you look good. He's like, I, I told you we shouldn't have sat in front. He's like, I'm gonna go hide in the back, jerk. I'm gonna hide in the back, jerk. Oh, look at you, so beautiful. I, 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 may I guess? If I'm wrong, I apologize. Ethiopia? Awesome, so gorgeous. I worked with a bunch of Ethiopian girls at a, at a, <laughs> at a restaurant. And they, they, dude, you know what's so funny? Like people, like, like they'll, they'll talk behind your back, you know, in their own language. They would always go <laughs> They would like, do, do, do you know what I'm talking about? They would do this Ethiopian thing. I go, I know they're talking about me, man, right? Well, they were so cute, man, I loved it. Aw, look at her. She's like, what are you going to say about me, jerk? <laughs> no, 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 I'm not going to pick you guys apart, uh, although I could. But um, <laughs> no, see, here's the thing. Uh, uh, yeah, so I was the keynote speaker. I don't know if you heard of my intro. I was the keynote speaker a few years ago at UCLA's Raza graduation. So you know, every year UCLA has their graduation, and then they have a Raza grad for the Latino students, you know, with mariachis and pan dulce. You know we do it. <laughs> so, oh, they should have had some pan dulce right here for us, huh? Man, I haven't had some conchas in a long time. Wow. <laughs> Look at your faces. What's a concha? <laughs> uh, <laughs> concha's like a Mexican sweetbread or a Salvadoran sweetbread. <laughs> That joke usually gets bigger laughs because most people get that it's funny, but you guys are like, no, we seriously do not know what a coach is. We have no idea what you just said. <laughs> it's Mexican sweet bread. But. So UCLA had over 300 Latino students graduating at their Raza grad. 300 Latino kids from all over the country graduating with their bachelor's degree. They had over 200 students getting their master's and their PhDs. So over 500 Latino kids graduating from UCLA, and then they had about 5,000 of their friends and family at the graduation, right? Because, you know, one of our cousins graduates, the whole family shows up, right? I heard there was free pan dulce. Pa donde voy? Pa donde voy? Where do I go? I brought the foil in the back to take some to go. Let's do this, right? You ever be at a party, your mommy's sneaking chicken in her purse right there, you know what I'm saying? You're like, don't be doing that, mom, that's ghetto. <laughs> but give me the big piece, give me the big piece. <laughs> you ever complain that your mom did something and then complain she didn't do it for you? <laughs> don't be doing that, did you give me some? Did you give me some? <laughs> and what I told those UCLA graduates, the same message I'm delivering here today at Highline College, is that it's beautiful that you guys are here figuring out what it takes to navigate the terrain here in college and then eventually either transfer or graduate from college here. Why, well, well, it's not just the fact that you're here. The fact that you're here is beautiful, but it's about graduating from college. A lot of students go to college, not a lot or as many graduate. In, in the Latino community, it's about half of the students that start their college education do not complete it. So it's about graduating from college. Why? The day you graduate from college, the day you can say, I am a college graduate, you will instantly transform the perception that people have of our community. How many of you know what I mean when I say that when most people in the world hear the word Latino, when most people in the world, I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about most people in the world, hear the word Hispanic or black or white or Asian, but especially communities of color like black or Hispanic or Latino, certain images pop up into their head as to who they think we are. And I know in your hearts you tell yourselves, that's not who we are, that's who you think we are. Who we really are, are beautiful, powerful, educated people who contribute to this country. That's who we really are, right? Yes, you may clap. That's who we really are. That's who we are, right? That's who we are. It's so cute. I saw at least 10 of you go like this, go, I think we're supposed to clap right now. I think that was, that was really, I like that, right? <laughs> so uh, I know we've had speakers all week that you're probably not used to reacting, but for me, reacting.
have to please, okay? I want you to clap if you want to clap. I want you to laugh if you think it's funny. Let it out, okay? And sometimes you want to be respectful and quiet and all that stuff. Not here, not now. This is a comedy show, okay? Empowerment comedy show. So please clap it out. Clap it out, everybody. Let it out of your system. That's the thing about me, I don't want anybody to suppress themselves. I like, we, we, we are being taught as a society to suppress ourselves. You know, I mean, there's, there's this thing about acting appropriately and acting professionally, but I think a lot of us have interpreted it as shut the heck up. We have interpreted that as shut up. You know, keep your head down, work hard, and shut up, right? You've heard that before, right? No, I want you to be yourselves. I want you to be authentic. I want you to be genuine. You, there's a little still, small voice within that knows who you are. You know, one thing I tell students, I perform in high schools all over there. Next week, I'll be uh, in Yakima, and I'm performing at a bunch of high schools in Walla Walla, and in, in, uh, Pasco, <laughs> performing in small little towns like like Mattawa, Washington, <laughs> Waluk High School. That school's so small they don't have a red light, they have a stop sign. <laughs> That's how small that school is. And when I perform for the kids, I always tell them, I'll tell you the same thing, I'm not here today to tell you who you are. I'm here to remind you of who you already know yourselves to be. You already know who you are. You already know you're beautiful, powerful, educated people. But sometimes we forget Sometimes we forget who we are because we get so caught up in life and start trying to play by the rules or live up to people's expectations and we forget who we are. But if you just get restored back to who you know yourself to be, then everything should be fine. Like, you know how I know that you know? Because I want you, each, each one of you right now, to think of the person in your family who loves you the most, the one who loves you unconditionally, right? For most of us, it's grandma and grandpa, right? Like, they just love you a little too much sometimes, you know? You know, grandma's like a little too sweet to you. Like, grandma, don't be nice to me. I was mean to my mom today, right? <laughs> Or a lot of us, it's nieces or nephews or sobrinas or sobrinos, little brothers, little sisters, little cousins. But when grandma talks to you, she talks to the real you, right? She talks to the, have you ever tried to be your, 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 your professional self around grandma? She's like, don't do that in front of me. I don't want to see that person right now. I want the real you. Come put your head right here. Put your head right here, right? She can pop your pimples and play with your ears and all that stuff, right? <laughs> some of you got grossed out. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, I miss my grandma, right? <laughs> My grandma used to pop my pimples when I was 12, dude. I loved it, bro. I go, Grandma, Grandma, I got to do it. I got to do it. She's like, hey, yours are good, mijo. Yours are really good. They really pop out. I like these, mijo. <laughs> I'm sorry, but those are my memories of my grandma. And how it's so funny because half of you are going, ugh. The other half are like, yeah, me too, me too. Uh, <laughs> And what happens when grandma talks to you? Grandma talks to the real you, right? And she says stuff like, ay, linda, preciosa, querida de mi vida, you're so beautiful, mija, you're the most beautiful girl on the planet, mija. And in your heart, you go like this, you go, I know, huh? <laughs> it's true. Ay, <laughs> why doesn't everybody know? <laughs> you should tell everyone, grandma. Ay, you're like the only one who knows me. <laughs> now, is grandma making up a lie about who you are? No, she's not trying to convince you of something that's not true. To you, to her, you're the most beautiful girl on the planet. Now, so grandma knows the real you, and when people speak consistently with who you already know yourselves to be, what happens? A little bell goes off. Ding, 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 ding. You got it, grandma. <laughs> but when people say something about you, or your race, or your culture, or your, or your, or your, or your heritage, or your, your community that's inconsistent with who you know yourself to be, what happens? You have a reaction. You go, ew, what? No. And a lot of times we get mad, we get angry, you know? you know. I know you've heard this quote before, but he who angers you controls you. Anybody who can say or do anything that has you react in a way that causes you to be not yourself, they have control over you. But when you know who you are, when you're, when you're steadfast in who you are, you know, next time you get, and it's easy to get reactive maybe nowadays. Please don't watch the news, man. Please don't watch CNN. You ever been through the challenge and see CNN, you see the dude and he starts talking and he's like, <laughs> like, you know, 30 minutes later, you're like, why am I still watching this? You know? It's because they know how to play into your brainwaves and they suck you in, you know? But you got to be careful what you, what you put into your brain. Let me, let me get back to this whole UCLA thing. Um, you know, like I said, they had uh, over three, all these students graduating uh, from UCLA. And the message that I was delivering there is the same message I'm delivering here. It's that it's beautiful that you're here figuring out what it takes to get through Highland College and then graduate. Why? Because the day you graduate from college, the day you can say I'm a college graduate, you will instantly transform the way people listen to you. You say, I grew up in Seattle and I graduated from UW, let's say. And you say, oh, you graduated from college? Oh, 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 oh. 
And you'll literally see them shift the way that they listen to you. I don't know if you've noticed this before. Some of you have, some of you haven't. You see, I grew up in Federal Way or in Tacoma, and I graduated from college. People say, oh, you graduated from college? Oh. And the whole way that they relate to you shifts. But here's the message. No matter how much education you have, no matter how much money you ever make, no matter how much affluence you attain, if you grew up in El Barrio, if you grew up in the neighborhood, you will always have a little ghetto inside of you, right? <laughs> See, I saw a bunch of you go like this. A bunch of you went like this. That's right, what's up? <laughs> and a bunch of you went like this. No, stupid dumb, I'm not ghetto. <laughs> And it's so cute, some of the Asian girls over there, they're like, um, I'm not even sure what that means. <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> see, uh, see, I don't mean chunti ghetto like our cousins, okay? <laughs> Do you guys know what chunti ghetto is? See, I, I have to like, uh, regionally, my, my jokes have to shift a little bit. Chunti ghetto, we say that in LA, California, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Chicago, they say chunti uh, in Texas, but not, maybe not here in Seattle. Chunti ghetto is like ghetto to the max. <laughs> Like, when you know you're ghetto and then someone else is chunty ghetto right there, you know what I mean? Ghetto's that one cousin a lot of us have. It's like, what eh, I'm ghetto, eh, what eh. <laughs> What's my name? What's my name? You can't read? You can't read my name right there? You can't read that? No? Oh, where do I live? I live right there. I live right there. <laughs> I don't mean chunty ghetto. I mean ghetto fabulous. Clap if you know what I mean by ghetto fabulous. Clap if you know what I mean. Okay, a lot of you are clapping. Some of you are like, just clapping to be polite. I think I know what you mean, right? See, I love being back here on the west side of the country. Here in Seattle, it's cool because a lot of Latinos in Seattle, which is cool. But I perform on the East Coast all the time. I was the national spokesperson for the Hispanic College Fund I worked with the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. And the College Fund was housed in D.C., so I was always in Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. And I have to explain to the Mexican kids in Virginia what a taqueria or a taco truck is, okay? Do, do I have to explain to you what a taco truck is? No, my uncle one on Sundays. Here's his card. Here's his card. <laughs> he does quinceañeras, weddings, bodas. Your cousin gets out of jail, boom. Taquero right there, man. <laughs> He's part-time taquero, part-time mariachi, depending on what you need, right? <laughs> I go to Virginia and I'll ask the Mexican kids, I go, where do you guys go for Mexican food? They're like, Taco Bell. Oh. I'm like, no, dude, I'm talking about real Mexican food with corn tortillas. Oh my God, Chipotle, totally, Chipotle. <laughs> Like, no, dude, I'm talking about a Mexican man pushing a shopping cart in an alley behind a car wash. <laughs> and there's a little white light dingling right there. <laughs> and you're driving with your dad, and you're like, ooh, there's tacos over there. <laughs> and you pull into some random alley, and you're eating tacos on a milk crate, right? <laughs> okay, see, for those of you who have never been to an authentic Mexican makeshift taqueria. See, in LA, I don't know if they do this here in Seattle, but in LA, there's all these entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, that on Thursdays and Friday nights, they make a taco stand in front of their house. <laughs> They just go into some alley and they start cutting up meat and all of a sudden there's a line of 30 people <laughs> waiting for tacos, right? And if you've ever been to an authentic Mexican taqueria, a real Mexican taqueria, the taqueros have figured out, the guys that make the tacos have figured out that you gotta make the tacos with two corn tortillas. I don't know if you've <laughs> noticed this, two little corn tortillas, why? Because if you make the taco with just one corn tortilla, you cannot do the very traditional pinch, lift, tilt, insert method, right? <laughs> now. Look at half your faces. Oh my gosh, I do that. I didn't realize I do that, but I do that too. See, when you grow up around Mexicanos, there's certain customs you were taught. No one taught you that you were taught them. You just did them because everyone around you was doing them. And pinch, lift, till, insert is one of them, right? Have you ever seen a non-Latino eat a plate of tacos for the first time, right? Non-Latinos, it's so cute. Like my buddy Craig, blonde hair, blue-eyed Craig. I was the best man in his wedding, civil engineering major, as white as white can be, right? I go, bro, he goes, dude, let's get some tacos, dude. Let's go, dude. Let's, let's, let's ethnic out, bro. Let's go get some tacos, dude, right? So we go get tacos. He's used to eating tacos like at a Mexican restaurant with a mariachi and a sombrero and sitting down, right? But I take him to a real taco truck, a mixture where you have to stand and eat tacos, right? He's like, where do you sit, bro? I go, get the milk crate right there, bro, right? <laughs> and so I gave him a plate of four tacos, right? You know, I gave him a plate, and he got the plate, and he goes, oh, uh, 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 can I get a fork and a knife, bro? I'm like, no, dude, just pick them up and eat them, bro. Just pick them, he pick them up. Oh, let's see, okay. How do I pick these up? Let me see. Um, no forks? Okay, um, wow. You have a third world country, I guess, but let me see here. <laughs> Let me see, do I, how about if I cut? Maybe if I cut the taco, if I cut, 
I go, bro, you don't cup the taco, dude. You pinch, lift, tilt, and serve, dude. And the tilt has to be just right. Pinch, lift, and then you have to tilt at a perfect angle. The timing of it and the angle has to be just right, or else you might bang your nose a little bit right there. So, for most, see, these are all things you don't even think about. Do you think about tying your shoelaces? No, you just do them. But somebody had to teach you how to tie your shoelaces. Somebody taught you pinch, lift, tilt, and serve, right? And if you're a real Mexican connoisseur, a real Mexican taco eater, you do pinch, lift, tilt, and use your pinky to make sure that the meat falls out the back of the taco right there. Pinch, lift, tilt. Look at somebody like, stop it, mister. I'm getting hungry. Stop it. I'm getting hungry, right? But if you've ever had a taco that's made with just one corn tortilla, the juice from the meat usually cracks that tortilla in half, right? And you do pinch, lift, tilt, and the meat's still on the plate, right? <laughs> so most authentic taquerias have figured this out. So they use two corn tortillas, so you can do pinch, lift, tilt, and insert. But Latinos, we like to save money at all costs, right? So when we go to a taco truck, do we ever order four tacos or five tacos? No, we order two tacos, and then we separate each of the tortillas and make four tacos, <laughs> right? Spread the meat around. You always end up with that one taco, didn't get enough meat, it's like a cilantro taco. <laughs> see, the ghetto just popped out of half of you, see? See? <laughs> but just know, it's so cute. Those of you that are cracking up are like, <laughs> And then those of you who aren't really getting it are like, I do not understand this material. This is not speaking to me or my culture. I don't understand what's happening right now, you guys. I want to feel included. I'm feeling very excluded in this moment. No, you just gotta embrace it. Just love it and let it in. Just love it and let it in. This is how, this is how Latinos feel in the white classes, okay? That's how, so it's just like a re re reversal, right? A reversal of the dynamic here. And it's so cute. <laughs> Uh, it's so cute. <laughs> There's a lot of things that we grew up doing that we just automatically do, but somebody had to teach us. Like if you're at your grandma's house and you're eating uh, menudo or pozole, and then we like the traditional Mexican soups, we always like to eat them with a, a corn tortilla. So we say, Grandma, can I get a corn tortilla? What does grandma do? She opens that straw basket, you know the yes. straw basket? There's always like 14 heated up corn tortillas for two people. There's like two people, grandma keeps heating up tortillas. No, yeah, estamos bien, we're fine. No, comatelos, eat it, eat it. Grandma has calluses on her fingers. She puts her hands on the stove. Grandma, your hands! She's all. Oh. <laughs> like she can't even feel nothing no more. She's flipping so many dang tortillas. You know what I mean? And uh, you go, Grandma, can I get a corn tortilla? She opens that straw basket, she hands you a corn tortilla. How do Mexicans roll up a corn tortilla? We pitch the bottom and we roll that thing up. <laughs> Look at half of you went, <laughs> Or if you're, if you're ever eating menudo or pozole, we like to spice it up our soups. We don't like bland stuff. So we like putting oregano in our pozole. Oregano uh, comes in the same container as the Parmesan cheese at the Italian restaurants, right? <laughs> Have you ever been to an Italian restaurant and watched any non-Latino put oregano on their pasta? They're so patient. Non-Latinos are so patient. They're like, it's barely coming out. <laughs> it's hardly even coming out. Is this thing plugged up? <laughs> it's not even. Latinos, we don't have that kind of patience. What do we do? We unscrew the lid, we pour it in our hands, and we go like that. We use our hands like grinders. And we grind the oregano with our hands, right? And then, of course, we never wash our hands when we're done eating. No one ever taught us that rule, right? <laughs> we're just like, I'm out of here, dude. I gotta go. We'll see you later. Then we go to church on Sundays, and we're giving blessings to people. May peace be with you, and also with you. May peace be with you. And the pobrecita señora is like, oh, marihuanero, wow. He smokes the marijuana. Oh, I'm going to tell your family. I'm going to tell your family. You're like, no, 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 I say no to drugs, senora. It's oregano, te lo juro. It's oregano. She's like, oregano, uh -huh. I see too, whatever. <laughs> but if you've ever had a taco that's made with just one corn tortilla, the juice from the meat usually cracks that tortilla in half, right? And you do pinch, lift, till the meat's still on the plate. Yeah, so, so oh, I already did that joke. I already did that joke. I did that joke, okay? So. <laughs> There's a lot of things like that that we grow up doing. You know what's so funny? Some of you are gonna come up to me afterward and go, you forgot a ghetto move. There's another ghetto move, you forgot. When you run out of toilet paper and you go to McDonald's to get napkins, you forgot that one, you forgot that one, you forgot that one. So when you run out of toothpaste and you don't throw the bottle away, you cut the tube in half and you stick the toothbrush in there, you forgot that one, you forgot that one. 
You know what my mom made me used to do when we were kids? We were so broke, she used to make me use the same side of the Q-tip for both ears. <laughs> and then stick it back in face up, the white part face up. So it looked like you had a bunch of clean ones. So you're like, this just went from funny to disgusting really fast, really fast. <laughs> Some lady came up to me after a show, some lady was saying, she goes, Estabas que, estabas bien chistoso, mijo, you were so funny. You reminded me of my first baby when I was so young. I had my first child, I couldn't afford the, 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 ta the diaper wipe, so I would go to El Pollo Loco to get the towelettes. <laughs> <laughs> You're so cute, my mom did that too. <laughs> That's so cute, oh my God. You've been saving up, huh? There's girls that are saving up the toilets. <laughs> You know, it's a year ago, the hotels, you'd just be saving all the soaps and stuff like that. You got so many little soaps, you're never gonna use those, but just in case, just in case. They're free, might as well, they're free, they're free, they're free, might as well. Latinos and black love free, huh? We will drive 20 minutes out of our way to save three cents on gas, huh? It's like, but it's cheaper, it's cheaper. But the drive over there, you waste the gas going over there. That's not the point, that's not the point. That's not the point. I'm not gonna give them more of my money. That's not the point. We have no rationale. We just know like 199 is cheaper than 202, right? That's all we know. That one right there. I see the one and I get excited right there. You know what I'm saying? 203, that's like two bucks. 199, that's one and change right there. Right? <laughs> hey, that's funny. I just wrote that. That's a funny joke, huh? I just wrote that. I just improvised that one. That was a good one, right? Two bucks, 202, that's two bucks, but 199, that's one and change. That's, I just wrote that, you saw me write that? I never said that before, I've never said that. You just witnessed comedy in action as we speak. The creative process, the gods are talking, the comedy gods are speaking through me tonight. Uh, it's beautiful thing. Come on, come on. Oh, you want me to do your material now or what, lady? Dang, why don't you write a comedy show? This is my show, lady, not yours, all right? She goes, I came to see the jokes that I think you should do. <laughs> I'm an English teacher and I demand that I get treated. <laughs> She's so cute. How about the elotes? Do the elote joke. Every other comedian talks about elotes. I'm waiting for you to do it. <laughs> if you're not gonna do it, then what's the point? I came here to get represented. I need you to understand my connection to elotes. It is a visceral, emotional connection. And if you're here representing us, I want you to talk about corn. <laughs> so cute. So, no, so many comedians do love the jobs. I don't do any of that stuff. I try to keep it unique. You, you forgive me, forgive me. I try to not do what everyone else is doing. But I want you to talk about elotes. <laughs> you guys know, elotes is corn on the cob. In every community, there's a Latina walking around with a big bucket of corns on the cob, and she walks through every neighborhood going, Elotes! Elotes! Elotes to us is like the ice cream man, okay? We hear Elotes, we're like, oh, oh, Elotes! 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 Mama, Elotes! Elotes! And it's so wonderfully, disgustingly unhealthy for us. We think it's healthy because it's corn on the cob. But they put mayonnaise and Parmesan cheese and butter and sauce and tahini and chile and lime. And they spray it with lemon salt and all this stuff. And by the time you eat it, it's like a heart attack waiting to happen, you know? So, you feel better? All right, good. She's like, that wasn't quite what I had in mind, but. I wanted you to make it satirical, okay? <laughs> Don't just explain it to them. Tell them why it's funny. <laughs> so cute. Uh, I just, I try to stay away from things that we've all heard before, you know? You, you never heard of an empowerment comedian, <laughs> Mexican-American, Puerto Rican, Russian, and French Catholic Jew. <laughs> try to keep it unique. So here's the thing, you know, and these are the same, oh, oh so at UCLA's last of <laughs> That's kind of where I was going with this. Um, you know, I just like, you know, educating people on who we really are, you know, and trying to like present an alternative perspective on who people are because every single one of you in here knows that people think you are a certain way and you know you're so much more unique than that. Identity is fluid. Who you are has no box. It's fluid and it changes every day. And you, we kind of adapt. We're like water. Be the water. 
You guys know what I'm talking about? Bruce Lee, you ever seen that video? Just Google Bruce Lee water. Just Google that thing. Bruce Lee was a genius before his time, man. If social media existed, when, when he would have been president of the world. <laughs> Bruce Lee was a beast. Be the water. The water adjust. The water flow. Be the water. Oh, well, you can tell, you can feel how real and deep that is, huh? I gotta write more about that. I just watched the video recently and I was blown away by the brilliance. There's so much brilliance around us. Brilliance is everywhere. You ever catch yourself saying something brilliant? You're like, did I just say that? Where, where did that come from? I just thought that. I had that, that was my thought. I think I thought that. You ever go, I think I thought that. I think I thought that. Did I think that? Or someone taught, where did that come from? Those moments you want to cherish them and write it down and remember it. And Snapchat it, I guess, right? <laughs> if it didn't happen on Snapchat, it didn't happen, right? <laughs> It's like the new rule. All right, let me get back on track here. Let me get back on track. Is, you guys are so great. You know the, see, I, I, I teach leadership development workshops all over the country. Uh, and I teach emotional intelligence to high school and college kids all over the country. Maybe next time I'll come back and we'll do some of that. Uh, but one of the things I think about, uh, talk about is that powerful speaking is a function of powerful listening. You can't really have powerful speaking unless you have powerful listening. And the listening in here is so rich, it's so powerful that like, I want to share more with you. Like I, I just totally went off track, you know? I, I'm not even doing jokes, I'm just talking from my life. And the elote lady right here. And, uh, <laughs> right? and so let, let, let me get back on track a little bit here. Is that, that these are the same jokes I did at UCLA's Rasa graduation, right? And what was beautiful to me was the audience was laughing. I'm a comedian, I do jokes for laughs. But what was even more important to me, more poignant, was that after the show, there was a big long line of people to come talk to me. And the line was filled with tias, tios, primos, cousins, grandmas and grandpas, abuelitas and abuelitos, coming up to me to say thank you. Thank you for not only celebrating our child's accomplishment by graduating from UCLA, but thank you for not letting them forget who we are, where we're from, and the obstacles we had to overcome to get them to even go to UCLA. I said, wow, there's something beautiful about embracing every piece of who we are. And that's one of my messages here today. You gotta love and embrace every piece of who you are, including the ghetto or the survivor within. Look, if you don't like that word ghetto, replace it for survivor. Because trust me, if you're a student here today at Highline College, you are the product of a survival story. If I give you, I'm serious, if I give this mic, in that leadership workshop that I do, I have students reveal their story. And it doesn't happen right away. It takes an hour or two sometimes to get students to feel comfortable enough to be vulnerable to tell their story. But when, if I give this microphone to any one of you and said, tell us what your dad had to overcome and go through to get you to be a student here today, we'd all start bawling. The real story, not your elevator speech, not the story you want people to know, the story you don't want people to know. If I asked you to share how many houses your mom has had to clean or how many jobs she's had to have or all the tragedies and drama that are going on in your families, we'd all start crying. And then we'd want to share our story, right? So if you don't like that word ghetto, replace it for survivor. But as far as I'm concerned, shoot. If you're from the ghetto, you get to. If you're from the ghetto, you get to be street smart and book smart. If you're from the ghetto, you get to know what time it is in the classroom and in the hood. If you're from the ghetto, you get to be proud of your education and of your culture. So if you have a little ghetto and you can hear make some noise, a little ghetto and you, a few of you, a few of you. Uh, I, I can tell some of you are feeling me and some of you are looking at me going, but we're not ghetto though, okay? <laughs> we have worked too darn hard to still be ghetto Ernie. We are trying to get out of the ghetto, okay? <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe what we need to do is embrace the ghetto within. Right. Uh, look, if, you don't, if you're not feeling this, Here's the ultimate test if you think you might have a little ghetto inside of you. <laughs> when you run out of shampoo, do you throw the bottle away? No, no. no, you pour the water inside, shake it, pour it on your head, right? Right? Everybody does that. Everyone does that. Even the teachers are like, we do that too, we do that too. That's actually not being ghetto, that's being thrifty. <laughs> There's ghetto and there's thrifty, and that's definitely thrifty. <laughs> but those of you with a little bit of money, you guys fill that ball up the whole way one time. Shake it, pour it on your head, then throw that thing away. That's being a waster, dude. <laughs> Not us, Latinos and black kids, we fill it up a third of the way, huh? Because that soapy water, that's like three shampoos in one right there, huh? You fill it up a third of the way, shake it, put some on your head, then you put that thing back. <laughs> Then the next day you go in there, you get the shampoo bottle, you open it, you squeeze it on your head. <laughs> that soapy water's cold. <laughs> that water's cold. 
<laughs> okay, only the really ghetto people are laughing now, too. And finally, the last day you go in there, you get the shampoo bottle, you open it, squeeze it on your head, <laughs> nothing comes out, you're like, shoot, what do I do now? Like the good ghetto person that you are, you wrap a towel around your waist, go to the kitchen and get palm olive dishwashing liquid, baby. <laughs> Heck yeah! <laughs> Look at half your faces. You just crossed the line on that one, mister. <laughs> cross the line. Hey, do, do a lot of you have to go to a class right now? Is that what's happening? Yeah. Well, it starts at 11? Oh, so bum. The ending is the best. The ending is gonna get deep. So if you don't have to go, or if you can ditch your class like this lady did right here for me, <laughs> please do, because the ending is amazing. So go ahead and take off if you have to, but please stay if you can, because the ending is the best. The ending's the best. Sorry, guys. Oh, did you have fun, though? You had fun? Yeah. You had fun? All right, cool. All right, can we do me a favor? Can you guys all come sit in the middle now, please? So I can have everyone up in the middle? Come on, come sit in the middle, just so I can have everyone. The ending's the best. Don't leave if you don't have to. If you can miss the class and get the notes, do that, because the ending is worth it, I promise. <laughs> the ending is worth it. All right, you don't mind? Thank you, come sit in the middle. You gotta leave? Oh, nice to see you, buddy. Nice to see you. All right, thanks. Thank you, buddy, thank you. Come sit in the middle, don't leave if you don't have to. Don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. The ending is the best. The ending is what Joe wanted me to do. You just saw the jokes, you didn't see the empowerment. Please don't leave. <laughs> Don't leave if you don't have to. I promise you it's worth it. I promise you it's worth it. Aww, I didn't know that. I didn't know a bunch of people were gonna leave. Yes, yes, you're still here. The small crowd that could. All right, give yourselves a round of applause for sticking around. Thank you, you guys, I appreciate it. So awesome. So that's the thing, you know, I, I go across the country and I tell students that I'm not here to tell you who you are, I'm here to remind you of who you already know yourselves to be. And you already know yourselves as beautiful, powerful, educated people. You know, and I, I grew up in a neighborhood where people always taught us, taught, tried to tell us who we are. You know, when you grow up, clap if you grew up in a neighborhood where there were either cholos or gangsters in your neighborhood or in your surrounding communities. Clap if you were in that neighborhood. So most of you will appreciate this. Those of you who didn't clap, you'll still understand it. See, when you grow up around cholos or gangsters, you don't really fear them. They're just part of the neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? They're just, you know, it's like, imagine if a bunch of cholos walked in right now, like six pelones, bald-headed, white t-shirt wearing, orale, homes, what's up, eh? A bunch of you'd be like, security, what's going on? Security, <laughs> security, <laughs> are, are they your cousins? Are those your cousins? Are they here for a victory outreach car wash or a, a bake sale? Is there a bake sale going on? Is there carne asada? What's happening? I don't get it. Right? But if a bunch of cholos walked in right now, I'd be like, all right, cool, I got backup, we're straight, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I got to ride home right there. It'd be on a bike, not on a car, but I got to ride home at least, right? And it's weird too, because you know, I always tell students, be careful of what you put in your brain. Try not to watch the news. The news is just about sucking you in, making you fearful, and then throwing commercials at you so you go consume whatever commercial, oh, I got to go buy that burger because I feel so lonely and afraid, right? And so, oh, that went right over your heads? No. <laughs> no, that's what the fear of manga. You know, news is all about making you afraid, scaring you. Have you noticed that? It's like bad rape and molesters and car accidents and death. And then at the very end, oh, and a fireman saved a kitten. Yay. You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to watch this again tomorrow. Right? And then they throw all these commercials. Are you depressed? Are you lonely? And like, I need that. I need, I'm going to go buy that. I'm going to buy it right now, as a matter of fact. Right? But here's the thing. There's this show on the History Channel called Gangland. You guys ever heard of Gangland, yeah. right? Now, I love the show because it's based in fact, right? It's based in court documents, but I don't like it because it makes us fear our own community sometimes. You gotta be careful what you put in your brain. I was watching it one time and they're all, some of the most notorious of all of LA's gangs comes from the small Mexican-American community of Highland Park where the avenues run the streets. I'm like, that's where I live. <laughs> <laughs> it's dangerous right here? <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> Go to the store to buy milk, I can't, I might get shot. <laughs> you know, and it's a weird phenomenon too, because I perform in middle schools and high schools all over the country, and these little wannabe cholos, you know these little yeah, wannabe cholos? Yeah. They're just basically little dudes that didn't play football, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they, they, everyone wants to be on a team, right? <laughs> they didn't play football or soccer, so they joined a the gang, you know what I mean? <laughs> they can't kick a ball or throw a ball, so they steal a ball and end up in a gang, you know? <laughs> and my heart goes out to these kids, because if you listen to the news, they're always exaggerating. The media is always like, some of the most notorious of LA's criminals, some of the most notorious of Seattle's gangsters. I'm like, notorious criminals? No, it's not. That's my cousin Nacho and his homies right there. He's not notorious for nothing, that guy. The only thing he's notorious for is not having a job and eating my mom's food all the time, man. You're gonna come over and eat, bring some tortillas at least, fool. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a cholo bad. I did. You know what's crazy to me? I can't believe there's cholo problems in Washington, man. I perform at Yakima all the time. 
I grew up at some tiny high school called White Swan High School on a reservation somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And there's gang problems in Mattawa. Mattawa, Washington doesn't even have a stop sign, a red light it has a stop sign. And there's a Norteño Sureño problem, North and South problem in this little town. I'm like, what are you guys fighting over? Apples? <laughs> red apples, green apples, red apples, green apples. So little Cholo comes running in, Cherries, Holmes, Cherries! I'm like, come on, dude. Give me a break, bro. I live in LA where the Mexican Mafia runs the streets. You know, the Crips and the Bloods used to run stuff, but now we kick them all out. Now it's the Mexican Mafia and the Salvador and Salvatrucha down there, right? And, you know, I know you can get killed in Yakima too, but in LA, killings are like an like everyday thing. You just don't even hear about it no more. And it's weird, because I wanted to be a Cholo bad when I was a kid. You guys all seen that movie Grease? Everybody's seen Grease, right? I got chills, they're multiplying, and I'm losing control. <laughs> Look at the girls wanna go, you're the one that I want. <laughs> no, you're the one that I want. Look at their faces. Oh my gosh, we always sing that one at karaoke. <laughs> Remember the drag races in Greece? Remember when those cars raced in Greece? That was along the LA River. Now the LA River's not really a river, it's just a bunch of cement with a stream of water in the middle of it. <laughs> But we turn the LA River and Dodger Stadium where the LA Dodgers play baseball. There's a little body right there. And the Cholos will run that part of town. We call it Frog Town. That's the name of their creek. Frog Town. On the other side of the LA River, over here by General Hospital, a lot of your parents watch that so popular General Hospital. The Cholos will run that part of town. They call it Dog Town. And when I was a kid, Frog Town and Dog Town didn't get along. I never understood that growing up. I'm like, we're all Latinos. Why don't we get along? They said, cross the river, see what happens. <laughs> I said, I ain't going over there, dude. <laughs> Those Dogtown dudes were bad, too. Dogtown dudes walk around the neighborhood intimidating people. Dogtown fool, what's up? Woo woo! Dogtown fool, what's up? Woo woo! It's like, ay, perro. Couldn't imagine what they were saying on the other side of the river. Frogtown fool, ribbit. Ribbit, ribbit. Don't make me get my ribbit on the hug. And I was like, ay, pobrecitos. <laughs> All I knew was Frogtown and Dogtown didn't get along. When I was a kid, I wanted to watch them drama. Because whenever they were doing that, oh, fool, oh, fool, oh, fool, oh, fool. <laughs> Look at their faces. Oh my gosh, she fights like my Theo, eh? <laughs> whenever they were going to throw down, there was going to be a rumble. A rumble at the river. There's going to be a rumble at the river. Shut up, dude, let's go. And there was something about it that was exciting. You could feel it in the neighborhood. The kids would be running inside. They'd be slamming all the doors. Grandma stick her head out the window. Ya metanse babosos! I love the word babosos. Babosos sounds like grandma is cursing at you. Baboso! Baboso just means slobbering idiot. That's all that means. You know when you fall asleep in class, right? And you have saliva hanging from your mouth right there? Those are called babas, right? And if that ever happened to you, then you're a baboso, okay? Uh, back in the day, Cholos, they didn't have cars to go to the rumbles. They used to go on their huffy bikes. We're gonna get these fools. We're gonna get them, dog. We're gonna get them, fool. So he's that one dude, he couldn't afford a bike. He just had a skateboard and a rope. Slow down, dude, slow down. Don't turn, dog, don't turn. <laughs> the dude on the handlebars, here comes the police, dude, go, fool. <laughs> and when you're a cholo on the way to a rumble, you gotta be hard, right? You gotta represent. You can't stop your bike with a handbrake. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> How do we stop our bike back in the day? With the heel of our shoe. <laughs> We're gonna get these fools, eh? <laughs> You're on that way. I was like, yeah, I wanna be one of those dudes. Those dudes are bad. Until my mom found the comb <laughs> on my pants. You know what comb I'm talking about? That round plastic cholo comb. You slide your finger in like that. You guys ever, ever seen those before? You never seen them? You have it in your pocket right now, huh, fool? Don't lie, don't lie. <laughs> He's so cute. He's like, dude, I'm not a cholo, dude, I promise. <laughs> I'm a skateboarder, dude. <laughs> I used to hide my gangster paraphernalia from my mom. My bananas and my cholo combs, but I forgot my cholo comb in my pants. <laughs> and my mom was doing laundry. <laughs> and she found it. She said, ¿Qué es esto? What is this? My son wants to be a cholo? Mi hijo quiere ser chola? Ernesto, vente pa' acá. Vente pa' acá, Ernesto. You get your butt over here, mister. I am going to show you what Cholos feel like. Dude, I was scared. I ran, I stood at attention. She put that Cholo come on, she was like, pow! 
I had indentations on my face for a week. <laughs> Turns out I was more afraid of my mom than I was the cholos, dude. I used to get protection from the cholos, from my mom, dude. The cholos, they beat you up once to get you into the game. Gosh, my mom beat me up every day. <laughs> my mom was always trying to teach me lessons, you know what I'm saying? Anybody else get a lesson teaching from my mama? Look at nobody wants to admit it right here. <laughs> I don't want to put my mom on blast, I don't want to. I'm pretty sure they're mandated reporters. I don't want to put my mom on that. <laughs> my mom was always trying to teach me lessons, and I was really good at blocking her teachings. My mom would try and teach me something, pow! I'd block it, boom! <laughs> Safe. She got mad when I blocked it, too, because I got good with it. She'd be all, pow, pow, pow. I'd be all, pow, pow, bing. <laughs> I got all Kung Fu Panda with my mom. Hi -ya! I got so good at blocking her teachings, she came up with alternative ways of teaching me things. She came up with a sneak. Anybody's mom do the sneak? <laughs> Real fast. <laughs> You'd be hanging out with your friend, she comes up from behind you, pow, boom. I, I didn't even see that one coming. You gotta give me a warning at least. Mom, 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 look, look, look. When you warn me, at least I can clinch. I didn't even get to clinch on that one. You got me all loosey-goosey. That's not fair. <laughs> one time I caught my mom slipping though, because she did the wind-up. She <laughs> your mom ever do the wind-up? <laughs> after a while, you can see your mom's blood starting to boil, huh? Don't worry, the empowerment stuff's coming. <laughs> so we're like, this cannot possibly be the empowerment stuff, right? <laughs> You ever be arguing with your mom and you see your mom's blood starting to boil? You know, and you say that one thing you're not supposed to say, you say it, ah, your mom goes, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Sigue hablando, baboso. Which means keep talking, slobbering idiot. But what do you be doing? You be staring at your mama going, no, 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 no. I caught my mom slipping, she did the wine and she went like that. I had time to react though, I was like, no. <laughs> Pobrecita, she's so cute. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna get to it in like five minutes. You guys wanted to do this material before I get to the, the ending's the best part. But I love talking about my mama <laughs> giving me lessons. <laughs> you ever get chased by your mama? No. <laughs> no me muevas, baboso. No me muevas. You make your mother sweat. I swear to. Ah! She gets. She gets her chancla. <laughs> The chancla, I love the chancla. You know why? Because my mom had bad aim. <laughs> she'd get the chancla, she'd throw it, I'd be like, Psh, ah, you missed. <laughs> 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 you can't find your shoe. <laughs> uh oh, you found it. <laughs> she gets her other chancla, chew. Be like, Psh, ah, you missed. <laughs> you only got two shoes. <laughs> Gunk, oh. You can't have three shoes. That's not fair. You go to school to tell your friends. You want your friends to feel sorry for you, huh, bro? You want them to console you. You want them to, my mom hit me with the chancla. You want your friends to go, no way, really? That's messed up. <laughs> not at our high schools, huh? You go to our high school, you'd be like, dude, my mom hit me with the chancla. What do your friends say? Fool, that ain't nothing. <laughs> you know what my mom did to me? She sold me out, dude. She told my daddy, pull out the cinto, eh? <laughs> the cinturon. And not the little skinny ones from Walmart. No, no, no. The big, fat, thick ones from Tijuana. <laughs> With the matching botas y todo, eh? Bailamos con el tuca, bailamos con el naso, bailamos con el tuca, 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 naso. <laughs> we have some rancheras in the house. <laughs> Look, you get it all cracked and they're like, oh my gosh, they played on my quinceanera! <laughs> and look at some of you like, I never got a quinceanera. <laughs> I didn't even get a sweet 16, guys. This is not fair. All I got was my driver's permit. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm almost there, almost there. So I finished the material right here. <laughs> You guys are loving it. I didn't think you were loving this so much. The high school kids love it. Ah! College, half the time, they're like this. This is inappropriate. This is inappropriate. You guys are like, ah! Because uh, after, oh, do, 
You know what my mom's weapon of choice was? Her teaching stick. A long yellow plastic wiffle ball bat. A plastic baseball bat. I can hear that thing coming. I can time it because of the wind. One time she missed, it went like this and went. My mom was right there. My mom was like the Latina Darth Vader with that thing. Come over to the dark side, Ernesto. I am your mother. After a while, your mom's have to touch you, huh? She just gives you the look. You know that look? Dude, the look is worse than the touch, huh? The touch, at least you know what's coming. That look, you don't know what's coming. <laughs> you ever be at a party with your family? You're like, hey, cuz, you wanna see my mom get mad right now? Come here. <laughs> She's gonna get so mad, dude, like a baby's gonna fall out of the throat away then. You think my mom's nice? She's not nice. <laughs> Then you go do that thing you know you're not supposed to do. Your mom doesn't even have to touch you, huh? She just goes, <laughs> Watch, complete the second half of the statement. Watch. Vas a ver. Vas a ver means you're going to see what happens when we get home, huh? And what do you be doing the whole rest of that party? You be kissing your mama's butt. <laughs> you're my favorite mommy. <laughs> my mom's like, I'm your only mother and you're still getting it when we get home. I'm like, dang, mama, you bad, mama. I said, where are you from, mama, where are you from? Oh my God, you're so cute. <laughs> Cause you ever get too old to be getting a lesson? You're 12 and you're taller than your mom. <laughs> Do you have any idea the fellas? Dude, when I was 12, I outgrew my mom. My mom went like that one time, all I did was stand up. <laughs> my mom was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I said, no, 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 I'm not gonna do nothing to you. Just don't do it to me no more. <laughs> ya no me pegues, okay, mama? <laughs> ya no me pegues. My mom was like, no me hablas así, baboso. <laughs> don't talk to your mother like that, baboso. Dame tu cara aquí. Give me your face right here. <laughs> you ever have to give your mom your face when you know you're getting a lesson? <laughs> okay, go, mom, okay, go. Mm -hmm. No, 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 mejor pompis, mejor pompis. I have more cushion here than I do there. I prefer this area, please. <laughs> oh my God, after a while, too, you ever, you ever talk back to your parents? Oh, one time my mom went like that. I went, stop it, I'm gonna call the police on you. <laughs> you know what my mom said, you know what she said? She said, good, call the police. I'm gonna do this in front of them. <laughs> that way everyone in this neighborhood that way everyone in this neighborhood knows what kind of a boy I have living in this house. I said, dang, mama, you bad, mama. I said, where are you from, mama, where are you from? My mama said, don't worry about it. They say I'm from nowhere. <laughs> My mother does not speak like that, okay? It just makes the joke funnier, that's all. Look at some of your faces, dang, Ernie G's mom, straight up hood rat. <laughs> My mom's like, tell them I'm a hood rat, mijo. I don't even know what that means. Just tell them, I don't care. Pa que aprendan, so they learn, so they learn. You know what's so cute? I've done these jokes all over the world. I was in Japan entertaining our troops with these jokes. I just performed at Stanford a few days last Saturday. Now I'm here at Highline College see, in Des Moines, Washington. And it always gets the same mixed reaction. Most of you, there in Stanford, like 50 50. Here it's like 25% like of you guys are cracking up, going, oh my God, that happened to me. <laughs> but the other 50% of you, a lot of the teachers at the high schools when I perform, they're staring at me with their arms folded. They're with a blank stare on their face. Who approved the budget for this person to come? Is this a, are we paying for this to be? And I'm sure a lot of those of you who don't, who aren't related to this are sitting there going, oh my gosh, did that really happen to these people? Oh my gosh, you guys, that is not okay. Under no circumstances is that ever okay. You guys, we are at Highline College. We have counselors available for you. <laughs> we can write you a referral note. You guys do not need hits, you need hugs. All we ever got in my house was a timeout. I, love, I wish I could get a timeout when I was a kid. I know you get timeouts for being disciplined. The only thing I know about timeouts was from soccer and basketball, you know what I'm saying? My mom would have been teaching me that since pass. Timeout! Timeout! <laughs> Yeah! 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 Okay, 
go, so go. Time out. 28, 29, 30, time Five. Look, I share this with you for one reason and one reason only. I am not up here condoning corporal punishment, okay? I'm not saying it's cool that our parents did that to us. I am saying this, that the only reason our parents ever did that to us is what our grandparents did to them. You do what you're taught. If you're taught by the hand, then you teach by the hand. But if you're taught with love, then you teach with love. That ended up being the greatest gift my mother ever gave me, to have me respect her more than I did the streets. The streets wanted me. There was a pull. I wanted to be a cholo bad. You know, I always have principals and administrators come up to me. Are you sure that this material is appropriate for our high school age students? Are you sure that our middle school? I just performed yesterday at Isleta Middle School on the border of Juarez and El Paso. Like you could see Mexico from the playground. And those kids, man, I'm like, they, are you sure it's appropriate? that they see, and like, have you seen the memes on their smartphones? <laughs> I'm not teaching them anything they don't already know, but here's the true answer to that question. That, you know, when I, I've talked to judges, behavioral health specialists, what makes something abuse? A lot of students have suffered real abuse, and what makes something abuse is the context. It's the anger, and it's done out of anger with the intention to harm. That makes it abusive. But what our moms, it was to teach us a lesson. She did it out of love, right? Isn't it weirder that the harder your mom hit you, the more you know she loved you, you know? <laughs> she got a good one in one time. Boom, hey, my mom loves me on that one right there, right? <laughs> See, that ended up being the greatest gift my mother's. When you, when you have suffer real abuse, you lock yourself in a dungeon in your own mind, and you think, no one can relate to me. Nobody knows what I'm going through. And you get depressed. But when you come to a show like this and people are cracking up, maybe you realize that you're not alone. That ended up being the greatest gift my mother ever gave me, to have me respect her more than I did the streets. The streets wanted me, there was a pull. I wanted to be a cholo bad. I wanted to get a spider tattoo, a teardrop tattoo, three dots for me, vida loca y que, wey. But I was literally more afraid of my mom than I was the cholos in the hood. Had I listened to the cholos in the hood, I would have ended up dead or in jail. I listened to my mama, I ended up being a college graduate. So I thank my mama every day for loving me that much. Thank you, Mama. So let me just wrap up by saying this. My mom, your parents are the reason you get to be who you are today. I'm going to repeat that. Your parents are the reason you get to be. You don't have to be. You don't have to come to school. You don't have to do well. You don't have to study. You don't have to do your term papers. You get to. You get to go to school. You know how many students would love to trade places with you? You know how many people who are 19, 20, 21, they're like, man, I should have gone to school. Why am I here digging this trench? Why am I here cleaning this job I don't even like? They would love to trade places. You get to go to school, and you have your parents to thank for for that. When it was time for me to go to high school, the conventional wisdom of the day is that the teachers would tell the parents of the black and Latino kids. Back in LA, the teachers would tell the parents of the black and the colored kids. Since your child's probably not gonna go to college, they should learn to work with their hands, develop a skill that will help them in the workforce, mechanics, electronics, woodcraft. Gardening would be wonderful for your child, since they're probably not going to go to college. The rich kids, they got encouraged to go to St. Francis College Prep. It wasn't even called St. Francis High School. It was called St. Francis College Prep because the expectation was you were going to go to college. The rich kids, college prep. The brown kids, trade tech. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, hey, my dad went to a trade tech. My brother went to a trade tech. I'm not discouraging trade techs. That's a great alternative for people who don't want to go to a four-year college. But I'm encouraging all of you to graduate from a four-year college. Highline's a great school, two years, and I know now you have some four-year programs. But get yourself into a four-year school and graduate with a four-year degree. Everybody here deserves that. My mama said, no, if those kids can go to St. Francis, my son's going to St. Francis. We just sneak across this border fair and square to have my son. <laughs> my mom stuck over here when she was nine years old, made it to California, boom, safe. <laughs> it took her nine, it took my mom, it took my mom 20 years before 9-11 to get her papeles, to get her papers. Right? Now, since 9-11, it's almost impossible to get your paper. It costs so much money. There's so many undocumented, you guys know about the undocumented dilemma here, right? It took my mom 20 years before 9-11 to get her papeles. She, my mom was a proud citizen of the United States of America, but it took her 20 years. So can we open our hearts and our minds to my undocumented dream students out there? My DACA and dream students, yeah? All right, cool. Last thing is this. So my mom said, you're going to St. Francis, but it's a two-hour drive, and I can't take you, so I can get up at 3.30 in the morning, take three buses, OK? And let's go. So I took three buses at St. Francis College Prep, all boys Catholic high school. There were three Latinos in my freshman class. <laughs> there were two black dudes, too, the running back and the quarterback of our football team. You know what I'm saying? You know how prep schools don't recruit, right? <laughs> Oh my God, I got crickets in here, man. I usually get to chuckle at least. You guys are like, that is not funny or right, right? <laughs> it's true, in LA they say that you're not supposed to recruit and they always recruit like two or three brothers to play on the football team. Anyway, I guess that doesn't happen in Seattle. We're all liberals here. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, 
Uh, so anyways, I go to St. Francis College Prep and that's where I met Ms. Donna Huckabee. Ms. Donna Huckabee is my one guidance counselor, that one mentor, teacher, or coach that looks at you in your heart, looks at you in your soul, that says something to you you didn't even know about yourself. How many of you guys have ever had a mentor, teacher, or coach say something in your face and in your heart you go like this, how do you know you don't know me? You know that feeling? Don't talk to me all comfortable, you don't know my life. That was Ms. Huckabee. She said, you're a leader, people love you because you're funny. Where are you gonna go to college? I said, I don't know, where'd you go? You know when someone's trying to love you too much, they don't even know you. Hey, sweetheart, how you doing? Where are you gonna go to college? I'm like, I don't know, where'd you go? She said, I went to Loyola Marymount University. It's a small Jesuit private Catholic university. I think you'll fit right in. Oh, well then I'll go there. <laughs> I took the SAT once. I applied to one school. I don't recommend students do that. But because of the love of Ms. Donna Huckabee, I got into Loyola Marymount and became the first person in my family ever to go to college right after high school. Thank you, I appreciate that, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you, when you graduate from college, not if, when you graduate, will be the first in your family to do so? Do we got some first gens in here? Give yourself some love, that's an amazing feat. That's an amazing feat. Why do young people become gangsters and cholos? Because somebody influences them too. No little kid wants to be a cholo. You ever see these little cholos at the mall? They're like two years old. They have like, you know, a little wife beater and a Raiders jersey or something, you know? You ever seen that? And you feel like, that kid doesn't even have a chance, man, right? Why do young people become college graduates? Because somebody influences them too. And for me, it was Ms. Donna Huckabee. I got into Loyola Marymount, and what happened? I got scared. I didn't have a lot of resources. I didn't have a lot of people teaching me. I didn't have a lot of love of people telling me, this is what you're going to expect. This is what's going to happen. I just showed up, and all of a sudden, it was all these people with more money than me. I started drinking, started partying, started hanging out. I managed a basketball team, so if you're a basketball fan, you'll love this story. If you don't love basketball, you still appreciate it. I managed the highest scoring basketball game in the history of NCAA Division I basketball. Loyola Marymount University beat U.S. International 181 to 150. Most points ever scored in the game. Why am I sharing this with you? Because my parents were never married. Uh, my, see, the, the leading scorer on our basketball team was this guy named Hank Gathers. Hank Gathers led the country in rebounding and in scoring. No player had ever done that before him. Only uh, two players had ever done that before him. He was the third ever. So he was on ESPN all the time. So I used to see him around campus. And see, my parents were never married. I am the result of a noche divertida. <laughs> my, my dad went salsa dancing, nine months later, boom, Ernie G, right? And so, you know, I didn't have a, a male role model in my life. So when I met Hank Gathers, he was one of the strongest dudes I ever met in my life. And I go, yo, Hank, my name's Ernie, I'm the manager of the basketball team. He said, hook up some towels, yo. Trying to clown me, right? I said, no, 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 I'm the manager of the basketball team, just want to introduce myself. He said, hook up some towels, youngin. He grew up in the projects of South Philadelphia. He didn't know I grew up north, north of East LA, Highland Park, he didn't know that. I said, hey, dog, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. <laughs> he said, all right, then come on, dog. Threw the ball at me, we started shagging, bam, we became boys. To this day, I still have Hank Gather size 13 Reebok, his number 44 practice jersey, his Loyola Marymount hoodie. Why? Listen, the whole thing about Hank, my parents were never married. So when I met Hank Gathers, the most powerful guy I ever met in my life, you know, I felt connected to him. But I, I never used to share that on stage. I wouldn't tell people my parents were married. I mean, after a show, some cholo came up to me, a gangster. He goes, hey, Holmes, can I talk to you for a second, dog? I said, what did I say, dude? What did I say? <laughs> he said, no, 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 te quiero dar mucho respeto, Holmes. I can't believe you put yourself on blast like that, homie. I'm like, what do you mean, dog? He goes, hey, my parents were never married either. And until I heard you speak just now, my whole life, I thought it was a mistake. But after listening to you, I realized, maybe I'm not. I said, God doesn't make mistakes, bro. Your job is to figure out why God put you on this planet and give your life over to that. He said, mucho respeto, Holmes. So now I tell people my parents were never married. So when I met Hank Gathers, the most powerful guy I'd ever known in my life, he became my boy and we were friends until March of 1990 when he went up for an alley-oop dunk on national television, dunked the basketball, had a heart attack on the court and died. The most powerful man I'd ever met in my life was gone in an instant. If there's any old school basketball fans out there, you've heard this story before. Hank Gathers is a really well-known dude who died on the court. When Hank Gathers died, I started drinking, started partying, started hanging out, got put on academic probation. You know what that means? You gotta get a 2.0 to stay in school. You got a C minus or a D now, but you can work it out next semester. You get on academic probation, you get a C minus, they kick you out. I went to my biology class, I looked inside, I was like, you know what, these people have no idea what it's like for me, man. They don't know what I go through. These rich kids, they have no idea what I struggle with. You know what, forget this, I'm out of here. Went to my bed, put the blankets over my head, and knocked out for three days. I slept for three days in my dorm room. You know how hard that is to do? Well, I did it and got kicked out of college. First person in my family to go to college to becoming another Latino statistic, a dropout, and it was devastating for me. 
I went back home and my mom was like, what are you doing here? I said, they kicked me out of school. She said, no, they didn't. You go back and you tell me you want to go back. I said, I can't. They kicked me out. She said, Nico, I came over here from Mexico when I was nine years old. And all I've ever wanted was for you to get your education. You go back and you beg them if you have to. But get back to school, Mijo. I said, I can't. They kicked me out. That come in. Bah! Went to my bed, pulled the blankets over my head, and knocked out. You think I slept for three days this time? Oh, no, no, no. Not at my mama's house. 5 a.m. the next morning, my mom was like, be good for something, take out the trash. I get the trash, I walk outside, I'll never forget this day. My foot hits the pavement, goosh. It went from no rain to rain. I fell to the floor, I was holding trash, and it was raining on me. I started thinking about my life. I had gotten kicked out of Loyola Marymount University. I owed that school $26,000 in student loans, and I didn't even graduate. I got arrested for drunk driving in the state of California versus Ernesto Vilichevsky. I told him my car in a car accident. I didn't have a job. I didn't have money. I didn't have a pot to pee in. I was sitting on the floor. I was holding trash, and it was raining on me. Now, I've never been addicted to alcohol or drugs, thank God, but that was my rock bottom. I hit rock bottom. I looked up to God, and I was like, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? Now, three days later, my tia got sick. Now, my tia, my aunt, is that one aunt we all have. Like, Christmas is always at your tia's house. Thanksgiving is always at your tia's house. If you're ever hungry, there's always a pot of beans or frijoles at your tia's house. I called her at the hospital. I said, tia, are you OK? She said, no, mijo, there's something wrong with my blood. They're going to do some testing. I said, can I come visit you at the hospital? She said, your mom's really mad at you right now, mijo. I said, tia, I want to come see you. She said, quédate con tu mamá. Stay with your mom. I'll never stop regretting that I didn't go visit my aunt. Why, the next day, my cousin called. She's dead, cuz. I said, what did you say to me? My mom wrote, said, Thea, she's dead. I said, no, no! I the phone and I threw it. God! I ran down the street, no, no, why? And in that moment, of all people, Miss Donna Huckabee popped into my head. She said, everybody knows that rage. Everyone has felt that anger. When you feel that rage and that anger, don't take it out on people, don't take it out on things. Get yourself a pen and a pad and write your feelings out onto the page. I got a yellow pad and a pen, I started writing. What is the point of life? Who cares about school or study or any of it when you can just take people from us? Hank Kellers is dead. He said, you took my Thea. How could you take my Thea? She was the most beautiful woman on the planet. She walked with the grace and dignity of an angel. Anybody who ever met my Thea loved her. I'm gonna miss you, Thea. Rest in peace, Thea, I love you. And all that rage turned to so much love. And I remember going to her funeral, and at her funeral, the priest was saying a few words, but he didn't know my Thea. He was saying stuff like, I'm sure Rose was a lovely lady, I'm sure Rose was a wonderful person, I'm sure people really cared about Rose. I'm like, what do you mean, I'm sure? Who is this dude? I don't care if he's a priest, man. People need to know who my tia was. Somebody needs to give a proper eulogy to my aunt. People need to know that it was always frijoles at my tia's house, man. <laughs> The priest said, you feel so passionately, why don't you say something? I said, uh, 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 uh. and in that moment, ding, Ms. Donna Huckabee. Always trust yourselves. We're not saying you can trust the world, Highline College, but you can always trust yourself. I looked out to the audience and I said, oh, to a rose. Why did my dear die? Why did God take the one angel we still had living on this planet? I don't know why she died, but I promise everyone here, I'm not going to let her death be in vain. I am going back to Loyola Marymount, and I'm going to graduate in her honor. And I ask every one of you, do that thing that you know you're supposed to do. Dance that dance. Sing that song. Construct that poem. Get your grades up. Get into the college of your choice. Graduate from the college of your dreams. If not for me and my dear, then for the people you most know and love. And then I said, I'd like to end this eulogy in a way my tia most remembered me by, and that is with a joke. My family was like, no, 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 aquí no hace eso. No, 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 you don't do that in church. Ernesto, Ernesto. I said, no, it's okay, my tia loved me for this. I said, how many roses does it take to make violets blue? I said, of all of us here today are violets, it only takes one. Rest in peace, tia, I love you. And it was silent like this. And my uncle was sitting right there, bro, and he stood up clapping and crying. And then they all looked at him, and they started clapping and crying. And they all went, <sighs> and I went, whoa. <laughs> I never felt that before. And in that moment, I captured for myself what Miss Donna Huckabee had seen in me, that I'm a leader. Not on time to tell you guys the whole story, but the short version is this. There was a big, long line of people that come talk to me. I thought the line was to give bendiciones a mi tía, blessings to my aunt in the casket. The line was to come to me. They said, how did you know what to say? How did you know what words to use? You said what I was feeling. I just didn't know how to express it. 
I said, I just trusted myself. And in that moment, I committed to getting back into college. Now, the short version is, I went to a school very similar to Highland College, Pasadena City College. I was committed. I'm going to take four classes. I aced them all. I took four more classes, aced them all. I got eight A's. I went back to LMU. I said, can I come back? I got eight A's. They said, come back in two weeks. We'll review your records. I showed up later with a, two weeks later with a suit ready to be reaccepted to LMU, the dean of my college, with a lot of the other deans at this big, long table. You know, the dean, a sister, a nun, a monha, said, after reviewing your academic records, we suggest you pursue your academic endeavors elsewhere. I said, no, 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 I, I'm doing this for my tia. She died. I got eight A's. What more do you want? She said, good luck. And I had a moment. Commit or sell out. Commit to my education, which once I have, no one can ever take from me for the rest of my life. I walk out feeling like a loser, walk out in shame, and sell out. I stopped, I looked back, I grabbed that sister's hand, I squeezed it. <laughs> I said, with all due respect, sister, nothing's stopping me from graduating from LMU. I'll see you again soon. I walked out of there going, I'm going to hell for sure, I'm going to hell for sure. <laughs> Here's the weird thing, the moment you commit, the universe will conspire to support your commitment. What did I just say? I said that the moment you say in your heart, in your soul, in your gut, if it is to be, it is up to me, all kinds of doors would open for you that would not have otherwise opened. So please repeat after me. If it is to be, it is up to me. Nice and loud, everyone. If it is to be, it is up to me. The moment you say that, meaning with every ounce of your fire, the universe inspire to support your community. Long story short, I got a random phone call from the dean of the psychology department, Dr. Renee Harang, who I had never met before. She said, hi, Ernie. I heard you want to come back to LMU, and I'm going to help you. You are? Who are you? How'd you get my number? What do I got to do? Train for the marathon? I'll meet you at the track at 5 a.m. I don't care. Let's do this. She's like, no, sweetheart. We just need to prove to them that you're serious. Long story short, I went to Pasadena City College, Santa Monica City College, UCLA Extension classes to take statistical methods for the third time in my life. I went to Cal State LA, took 14 classes, got 12 A's, 2 B's, 10 letters a recommendation from every teacher that gave me an A, and with the love of Dr. Renee's hands on my shoulders, got readmitted for my senior year. I made the dean's list my last two semesters in honor of my tia, and on June 14th, 1994, I walked up onto that stage, got my college degree with my name on it, looked out to the audience, hold on, and I said, Mom, Rose, I did it! I did it! I did it! And that is the feeling that each and every one of you wants to feel. The day you graduate from college, you will forever, for the rest of your life, be able to say, I'm a beautiful, powerful, educated person. And if you're like me, you'll always have a little ghetto inside of you. All right? Hey, I got two party gifts really quick before we go. Really quick, this one, I brought one of these for all of you, okay? This right here, I've never been married. I don't have any kids. I'm college educated. I'm pursuing my dream. I have a heart of gold. Basically, I'm a catch. And uh, the problem is I'm looking for a beautiful, powerful, educated woman who has a little ghetto in her, okay? I want the kind of girl I can sneak food with into a movie theater, okay? I want the kind of girl who gets turned on with a coupon, right? Uh, or who's in love with the elote lady. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But to honor, but this year for Valentine's Day, I didn't even take out a date. You know I took out for Valentine's Day? I took out my mom for Valentine's Day. That's right, boy, that's right. I had a good time too, took her to the movies, went to dinner, went to the theater after, and I didn't spend a dime, boy. <laughs> my mom knows how to treat a man. Uh, my mom was good to me. She didn't even pay the tip. I'm like, at least the tip, mom. She said, guarda tu dinero, mijo, save your money. It's a joke, people. I took my mom, I paid for my mom. But to honor my mom, the best way I know how, I decided to name my first comedy CD, Mama's Boy. Ah. People always ask me, is that really my mom on the cover of my CD? I'm gonna hire a model to be my mom. <laughs> She'll kick my butt. It's 52 minutes of clean comedy. I know college students are broke, but if you all buy one, then you can put it on Pandora and sell it and all that stuff. Anyways, just kidding. You can, you can look me up on Pandora. It was Ernie G channel. Um, please don't leave without getting one of these. I gave this to a girl eight years ago when she was a sophomore in high school. Who's gonna go to a local community college, maybe. She shot for the stars, got a full ride to Stanford. Graduated from Stanford, she just graduated with her master's degree in education from Stanford. She took a picture of this and posted it on Facebook and she said, when I forget who I am, I read that and it reminds me of who I am. It's my parting gift to Highland College 2017. Thank you, Joe, for bringing me out here, man. I look forward to coming back every year, maybe doing a leadership workshop with you guys. That'd be fun, right? My parting gift to you is this. Let's, and let's stick around. When we're done, can you guys come down here? We'll take a group picture, a group selfie. And then if anyone wants to have lunch with me, I'm getting hungry, so we'll go have lunch. Right? Oh, yeah. We'll go pants, lay, tilt, and surf, right? <laughs> My parting gift to you is this. 
If you heard the movie, if you saw the movie Coach Carter, you've heard this quote. If you saw the movie Akila the Bee, you've heard this quote, but you probably never heard it quite like this. My parting gift to you is this. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It's our light, not our darkness, which most frightens us. And that's not the way we think, y'all. The way we think is I'm afraid I might not be good enough. I'm afraid I might not be strong enough. I'm afraid I might not be smart enough. That's not what you're really afraid of. What you're really afraid of is how awesome and amazing you might actually be. We ask ourselves, who am I? Who am I? It's a very Latino thing to say. Quien soy yo? No, 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 por favor, quien soy yo? Who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You're a child of God and you were put on this planet to make manifest that glory of God that's within you, to let your light shine, bro. I had a little girl just like you, Miha, she came up to me after the show one time and she said, Mr. Ernie, you were awesome, but you kind of made me feel bad. I said, why do you feel bad, Miha? She said, I feel bad because I get straight A's. I said, excuse me? <laughs> why do you feel bad for getting straight A's? Because my friends and cousins get C's and D's and they make fun of me. I said, Miha, your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightening about shrinking so that people won't feel insecure around you. You are meant to let your light shine as children do. And when you let your light shine, you unconsciously give permission to other people to do the same. As you are liberated from your fears, your presence automatically liberates others. So I just want to say Highlight College. Please continue to let your light shine, and thank you for letting me let my light shine. All right, you guys, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, bro. I appreciate that, man. Oh, a little standing ovation. All right, come on down. Come on down. Take a picture here, man. Here, man, before you go.